I think this is the final in the series of looking at the National and Panasonic VHS video cameras. This time we got the NVMS1. It's an SVHS version and I think it's based on the uh, NVM7, but we'll find that out. Yeah, last time we took apart the M7 and had a look in it, and they do look a bit similar the way that goes down there. The shape under it. That there's some extra controls there. You can manually control color, phase, and iris. But the M5. I found the M5 and the M7 were quite different inside, so I'm interested to see what's inside this and we'll compare it to the insides of M5 and M7, see or how they compare. Now I've got two of these. This one has got a tape stuck in it. Well, I, it's a tape in it. I don't know if it's stuck yet. I don't know if I've ever turned these on. But I've got... there's another one here. This one seems to be in quite a bit worse condition. That's wobbly. And... The casing is not um, together properly in there, so perhaps we'll take this one apart first. It doesn't have a tape in it. Let's try them both out first. We'll see if we can eject this. What is it? Do you think there's an SVHS tape in there? Unlikely. Well, we'll see. It takes just like before. It's got the same adapter connector, but they've added now this video out. And maybe the key to what this is based on is by the position of that. Because on the M5, it's down here. Because on the M7, it's up here like that. So I think we've found the answer of what this would be most like. Let's plug it in and turn it on. Okay, it does not turn on. I guess that's why there's a tape stuck in it. Power supply is on. Okay, well that one doesn't work then, at all. Okay, let's try this one. It does turn on. It's making a pretty sad noise. It's making some hissing noise, maybe there's power supply issues. Nothing come up on the viewfinder. Is that plugged in? Yes. Power zoom moves. Yeah, uh, the monitor is just lines, like what we saw on the other camera, these flickering lines. That's a bit disappointing, not very much action that we can see. Yeah, that makes a terrible noise. I guess it's not really worth trying to put a tape in it. Should we do it anyway? And put the mold tape in that we found in the other machine. Let's see if we can get it stuck in there. It goes into play mode, but then the tape's not moving after that. Maybe the pinch roller is wrecked. Okay, I don't know what one we should take apart now, because, you know, they both don't work. Let's, let's open up this one that's in worst mechanical, physical condition, and have a look what's in there. But we also want to get this tape out and see if there's anything interesting on it. We'll do that later. I'm guessing this viewfinder is the same as the other one. Looks like it, with that deep hole for the, the focus and brightness. There's a tally light on the front and you can turn that on and off with a switch there. Okay, let's take these panels off. The style of this is a bit more nicer, professional looking than the M7 was. M7's a bit rounded, cheap looking. I guess because this is SVHS they've got to make it nicer so you can tell it is professional or more professional than just standard VHS uh, there's rust in the little battery holder thing in the bottom I don't think it's the battery that's caused that unless it was a... ah yeah it is, it's gone all crusty that's nice I don't really want to touch that yeah the battery has gone leaked and yeah left Residue in there. We'll keep that safe for later. This has a much bigger lens shroud hood thing on it. I'm gonna have to get that off to access that screw there. Does that come off? Normally they unscrew. Yes, it's just very tight. 
yeah, something must have happened to this. You know, that uh, mount there is missing. Maybe it got dropped. Maybe someone's tried to get in here before. Not sure about that, because the screws seem to be all still in place. I'm guessing the only thing that has to change to make it SVHS is the tape mechanism, because in these cameras that we saw, the video output from the camera section is already a S video type of signal, separate chroma and luma. So that's probably already suitable for yeah SVHS. There's quite a bit of dirt and spider webs and things inside there. Probably wasn't a good idea to put a tape in. Although we put in that dodgy tape so that doesn't really matter. Moldy tape which we've thrown out. Okay, let's try getting this apart. I think that's I think that's all the screws. Oh, yes, the microphone. Yeah, that one's a bit better because it's got earphone and microphone connector there, which is different to the others. Yeah, they only had microphone connector up there. Maybe there was an earphone connector somewhere else on those ones. Yeah, that seems to have come loose. It's loose. There must be. It must be under there. Look under that. Is there a screw from this side? Oh, it's bent. Yeah, that's... The metal is bent. Yeah, maybe the screw's got a little bit stripped out. Maybe it got dropped in the... Um, viewfinder... Banged. Yeah, there you go. It's tightened up now. Oh, is that different? Yeah, there's a ground wire. I didn't remember that before. And then there's that wire that you have to take the other side off before you can get to it. Feels like there's still something attached. Well, there's those screws there, but I thought those were just to do with that control panel. Let's undo them anyway and see if that makes any difference. It does. Ah, is this different? Yeah, look at that. On the M7. We didn't have to undo those screws to get the side off. They would just... I don't know what they do. Or well, they hold that assembly with the controls on the inside. But this this model, it seems those do have to come off. Very small screws. But not those ones. Or is it those ones too? Yeah. Anyway, we'll take them all off. Oh, that one's very loose. Yeah, the control board is retained to the camera assembly by those two screws which don't do up tight. Interesting. Shielding up to that between all the mounting holes. Now we can get that unplugged. That's the other side. A lot of shielding in there again. Okay, this one uses a different ribbon to join to the camera part. It's not one of those white off the shelf style. It looks more like a custom board. Not really sure why they'd need to do that. Nah, the camera comes off by undoing stuff on this side. I think that's the cassette loading mechanism that I was undoing. Ah, oh, look, there's an extra box there. That wasn't there on the M7, was it? Extra box? Nope, it was empty in that location. Maybe that's uh, something to do with the S-video processing. Let's try and find out. Yeah, the capstan is in pretty poor shape. And there's dirt on the, the audio head there. Okay, in order to take the camera part off, we need to take this off to get to a screw that's under it. Oh, it's a little bit blocked by the board. Oh, look at that one black wire they're going in. Seems to be a bodge. It's glued. It's glued at one end. And then there's a cable going up to there with the rest of the controls. Wires wrapped around that. And then there's the viewfinder output. Okay, that's the camera part separated. It's a bit weird. There's this black wire here going. Oh, it has a connector in there. 
but it's just soldered onto there and then it's glued that's quite weird can we pull this open to look at it yeah there's a connector in there that connects to that wire oh it's a red wire on on the inside or the other side not obvious what it does there's quite a lot of ground wires going to various places maybe this is a better performing camera because they've paid more attention to grounding and shielding maybe they've uh, done some things to get better performance out of it oh there's screws down there oh those are red screws deep down there we didn't have to take off those other ones okay the viewfinder connector now this shielding should open up Okay, that camera looks different to what we saw in the M7 model. It's not as compact. That's true, isn't it? Because the other one was squashed like, all together. And you see that as a custom board instead of just being a straight ribbon. It's been a custom-made flexible PCB. Custom-made for this application. This is a microphone connector there. Get this battery container out of the way. Now we have to move lots of things, don't we? Let's see what's in this box. Ah, okay, there's not very much on that side. There must be something on here. Okay, it's got some chips. BU378IF and a Mitsubishi chip M52055. So it's got shielded connections and a whole bunch of... I don't know where that's going to. We'll find out though. Get the battery holder part out of the way. Oh, that screw wasn't even done up tight. I think that looks like a connector there. I don't know what that is. Is that with some test thing? I think we have to take that off first. Okay, tripod mount, all plastic. That'll snap off easily. I can get rid of that because it's all got corrosion in it. Came apart. And I snapped off some posts. And you can see there's corrosion on the solder joints there. So the S video connector is right there. And that box thing doesn't seem to go to it. Cable ties. And there's tape. Sticky wires from the tape. Is this more difficult to open than what we found on the M7? I don't know what's going on. There's something holding it in here. I wonder if this board doesn't open until we get the battery thing out of the way. Oh, I can see some juice already. There might be leaking capacitors in this. Oh, maybe you're supposed to take that out, the little white bit with the contacts on it. I still don't know what's holding that in. Why wouldn't it just come out? Okay, there's the flat. Oh, okay, so you got to get this board out first. Ah, uh, that's right, you've got to take all this top bit off, then this board can come out, then there's another screw under there that's holding the battery um, container in. No, that's something else. Okay, I'm just pulling it really hard. Okay, so we've got to undo these little tiny red screws, then the control panel part with the controls on it can lift up then it will allow this board to fold down uh, yeah this is in very bad shape then we can get to the last screw that's what's holding the battery holder in and causing difficulty with removing it okay now this can get out of the way and we can properly look at what's going on in here Plug that memory backup wire because I don't really want that to stay here. And we'll disconnect the S video cable connector. Will that come out? Okay. Alright, now what have we got? You can see now we can work out where that this extra module connects. Free cable ties. Okay, that ground wire that we didn't see on the other, on the M7, comes from a shield around the adapter connector, which 
sure what else that connects to. Oh, there's a, that thing which squishes onto the mechanism and then also comes up to here, maybe? No, that just seems to be a ground for the remote connector it's separate to that one. I guess they had reasons, they would have worked something out and decided what things need joining to what. Now this board is in bad shape. I could see when I looked briefly there's stuff dribbling down there and when I look on this side there's corrosion down in here. See if we can get some of these wires out of the way so we can look at it. Wow look at that they're using a capacitor as a strain relief or a, a wire clamp. See that there's a, a long leg capacitor there and that's bent over these wires to hold them in position. That's pretty, um, yeah, dodgy. Just want to get these um, from, then put them back under that wire so that we can get it out. And they're using different pitch connectors and to help uh, identify them, though there are several that are the same. And for some reason, they didn't use different colors. Oh, they did for that one. But which went to the memory backup battery. Okay, so this extra board is on very long wires all the way over to there. So I guess they couldn't fit some circuitry in that was needed, but it was fine to have it all the way out here. I guess it's something related to the S video. I'll try and look that up and then we'll discuss it. So the S video out connector is on these wires that goes. Oh, look, there's another one of those capacitor strain relief things there. Okay, so that goes to two separate connectors. And what about those? What are those wires doing? And they go up to the audio head. Okay, so it must be an audio section up here. It says video I.O. Audio. Kind of in the same area. Then it's got, what is this? System control along the top. And into there. Power in that part. And then that will be servo in that part. And then luminance and presumably chrominance in that bit. I guess. Is that right? There's another section there. It says H dot A. I'm not sure what that is. That's where that is. Does this have... It doesn't have hi-fi audio, does it? It doesn't have hi-fi audio. It has HQ. So maybe that's what that thing is doing. It does say here in the list of features that it has 420,000 picture elements. I don't know if that's a good amount. It's like 0.4 megapixels, is it? 0.4 megapixels. That's kind of a standard definition TV signal amount of megapixels. I just remember having a, a digital camera that was 320 by 240 and that was something like 250,000 pixels back in the day when the way to get video or the way to get the still pictures off of your digital camera was to use the camera's video output and capture it using a video capture card that was their normal method or if you're fancy you could use a serial port with a special cable and download them with that iris 232 <laughs> not fast and there were bitmaps you had to manually save each one from inside this special camera software. Okay, well, we're getting sidetracked, but anyway. Yeah, so there's a bunch of corrosion down there on the board around those parts. And it looked like there was something leaking out over here. I'm not sure if that's actually a problem or not, or whether it was just some muck that had got in there. Maybe it's been wet. There's corrosion on the legs of that IC there. But I'm not sure if that's juice that's come out of a capacitor or whether it's just something else has dripped in. Hard to know what, what it actually is. Definitely something has dribbled down there. There's a brown mark and see there's a little outline where the plastic peg from the battery holder thing was pushing and you could see it was a little bit juicy. Somewhere around there. Let's compare this to the, uh, the M7's mechanical parts. Got here the M7 mechanism, and we got here the one from the M MS1. So these main boards, 
Looks pretty similar on that side. Same capacitor bodge type things, these weird fuses sticking up to your 92 fuses. And then those chips, and those. Capacitor bodge there, which is not on this one. Different amounts of adjustments there. Ah, that, but that says HA. There's an HA there, and there's a connector not fitted, which is the connector that goes these white wires off to that thing. But, interestingly, above it, there isn't the other connector, which is the one that takes those shielded wires. You look at the part number there, VJB03482. This is 03582, so it's slightly different. But it's interesting that it also has some of the stuff. There's a bunch of stuff over here that's not fitted, which is fitted on this one. So those must be the extra parts that give you the S-Video capabilities. Uh, look, and there's a connector there, not fitted, which is fitted on this. Well, it's not a connector. It's a little module with another IC on it. An AN3292NS. Okay, so that's a little bit of extra stuff to make it do good things. If we look on the component side, you know, that module thing's a different shape. There's an extra filtery thing. It's not fitted there. And there's some extra pads there which aren't on that one. But I expect most of this area would be the same because there's no reason for it to be different. Even those bodges, that wire comes over to there and then there's a yellow wire there that goes onto a little pad. It's done very badly. It looked like it was shorting out a capacitor. It's done a bit more tidily on there. Look how dodgy this is. The wire coming out of that yellow wire, the conductor from the yellow wire, is really long. The insulation stops too soon and it could easily touch both sides of that capacitor that it's next to. So whoever did that one was not doing a very good job. Stripped it back too far. Hmm, so that uses the same technique of clamping the wires down using capacitor legs. That's that's pretty dodgy. You've got to be really careful with the legs of electrolytic capacitors. Because if you bend them too much or disturb them, the seal in there can get compromised. And then the electrolyte will dry out and the capacitors will go bad a lot faster than they would if you hadn't been mean to them. So be very careful with capacitors and their legs. Especially the small sized capacitors because there is a lot more relatively seal compared to area than you get on the bigger capacitors where it's just two little legs and the outside and then a big area. Those ones there, it's it's very vulnerable to damaging the seal and then having it dry out much faster than it would have otherwise done. And so this is in much better condition. There's no corrosion and things showing up. Oh, no corrosions visible there. Whereas this is a bit dodgy. Yeah, these CPU things, that thing, the motor driver chips, I think they're the same. Okay, well let's look this up and see what the thing is. found a part of a service manual, it doesn't have all of the pages, and searching for that I've found this extra circuit. It's this thing that they call sub-video CBA. You can tell because it's got on there reference number 3800. So you know that the designators are going to be starting with 3800, which is what we see here. So it means on the board they just write IC1, 2, whatever, but you then add the 38 on the beginning and you get the actual full designator. It means that the, um, the numbers written on the board can be a lot smaller and don't have to waste so much space putting the full number. There's, that stuff is all over these. It says hash 6000 there and hash 8000 and for each section so you know how to work out the numbers. So it looks like it does a couple of things. It's something to do with turning off the playback chroma signal. I assume that's what that means because it can ground the chroma signal. So is that to do with uh, detecting whether it's a black and white signal? And then there's something to do with detects whether you're playing back a VHS, an SVHS tape or not. So it looks at the Y part of the signal, detects, which will be, I think, detecting the frequency of the luminance signal, detecting the higher bandwidth of the signal to then signal whether it's playing back SVHS mode or not. So that's what that is. 
extra bits that they couldn't fit on the main board I guess because it would have made it too big and yeah wouldn't have fit unfortunately it's not a full service manual which is a bit sad so we don't get to see the actual circuits it just finishes there with the viewfinder schematic and it goes through quite a bit of detail of how everything works so you can find it and read it yourself if you like it was a free download but it does mention that this camera is based on the M7 and brings the advantage of SVHS recording which increases the luminance resolution a fair bit but doesn't actually change the color resolution at all so the pictures are still a bit mushy in the color department as is with VHS, standard VHS so that's yeah, the differences there for the mechanism it's pretty much the same the video head would be the same as well, it might be it's going to have the same number of pickups but they might just be a little bit higher quality let's say amorphous something or other on the outside on the this is probably a bit better quality video head it's got the same numbers, the flying erase one there and the others but otherwise I think it's the same pretty much the same mechanism, that number's the same now if we have a look at the camera section Pretty interesting because I thought these would be the same but they're quite different. The MS1 camera here is considerably larger. This all compacted down quite nicely whereas this it's a fair bit bigger. Presumably that's because they put more effort into making it higher quality so it's got better optics and more refined circuits that give a better picture. Let's see if we can take off this sideboard and have a look in there. The problem is it's all joined to everything, isn't it? Ah, uh, there's a shield there. That's annoying. Can we get it out without that? Not without wrecking it. Okay, it's the same deal with that piezo thing in there. It's just everything spaced out a bit more. There's another sub board thing there. And then that bottom board is the autofocus. All the autofocus business. It's pretty independent of everything else. Yeah, other than that connector there, all the things, it's the focus motor. There's the sensors on the lens so it can tell what position it's in. Then there's those wires which go into the, the piezo thing through a hole there. And then there's that. Oh, it's got some stuff going into the iris. That iris motor's got more wires than usual. That's interesting. Not sure why that would be. Oh, yes, that little wire that went off to the control panel. It's coming from one pin of a connector there. It's so dodgy getting that off by squeezing the, the board into the beams. Anyway, so that's the camera. Now what we'll do is we'll take apart the other camera and we'll get the tape out of it and look at it for a while. The problem is to get in deep enough to uh, take the tape out, we're going to have to take apart the whole thing. No easy way, I don't think. Not like professional cameras where there's normally a little panel that you can open and then there's something you can push or turn to eject the tape. This doesn't have anything like that that I can see. And yeah, it still doesn't turn on. I'm guessing it's not a power switch problem, it's something more bad gone wrong with it. So let's see if we can get this apart. Probably we need to take this side off because we just need to get to the back of the... Oh, it's difficult because you've got to take that battery thing off to get... We need to get to the pulley of the loading motor. We'll see if taking just this side off opens up enough stuff. Unless we manually drive the loading motor with an external power supply that could work to eject it. You just got to make sure that you disconnect the loading motor from the circuit before you apply external power, otherwise likely blow up the uh, motor driver. Just get this out of the way. Now, how much of this will we have to undo? There's stuff in there. Oh, that would just unclip. Okay, it's like clipped together by the look of it. 
lucky that screw had to come out. Okay, what have we got here? Looks much cleaner, doesn't it? I think it would be easy enough that there's just a fuse that's blown and that's the only problem. Someone joined a battery up that was wrong or something. Maybe we should try powering up by the battery terminals to see if that works. Got a power supply. Let's see. 12 volts. Probably enough. And we'll try and join it up down the right way. Nope, doesn't draw anything. So it's really dead in a very fundamental way. There's no current consumption at all. Weird. I think we have to take the other side off in order to get to whatever's clipping this thing down. There's that over here. Okay, we managed to get it out without taking the other side off. Yes, if we look at the board, perhaps we should try measuring the fuses and see if there's anything going on there. I know there's a fuse looking thing there and then there's those ones that are soldered onto well then that's a shunt not a fuse 25 milliohms so the fuses must just be these thingies here all right let's check these two fuses that seems to be fine that one seems to be fine i'm guessing whatever's wrong is more wrong than just some fuses then it's got white stuff on it flux residue i guess I think there's another one there. Ah, okay. That, I think that might be a fuse. Not sure. Doesn't really say. It might be an inductor. Yeah, the measure's the same on that. I think it might be some kind of capacitor or, or I don't know, little white thing. Not really sure what that is. Anyway, it measures the same on both cameras, so I don't think that's the problem. Yeah, something could be blown. Let's try eject the tape. I need to work out which way to turn the this gear, because I can see the top of that in here. So what way do you turn that to unload? That way, okay, anti-clockwise. I don't know if this is all threaded up or not. Can't really tell from here. Yes, it is. It's in some state because, yeah, I don't know, it wasn't that fair. Uh, it was a little bit. So someone's tape, completely unlabeled, generic tape, not SVHS, or Sony brand. Wonder what was on it. Perhaps we should check that. Uh, just reverse the mechanism back a little bit. And that way the cassette door will latch in. Yeah, so there's something going on there. Perhaps the service manual can help us to see if there's something easy we can measure to debug why this thing doesn't turn on. There's at least some sort of block diagram of the power supply section. It tells you that's the power supply part there. It's got the 5 volts, 9 volts, 16 volts adjustments. Didn't tell you about fuses. Camera, power supply. The fuse there on the main input. Yeah, so there's a nice clean power supply here. 16 volt minus 8 volts. And then there's some um, other regulators there for all the other business. So there's a power on switch fuse. We know those two fuses are fine. I just noticed something. Looking at this test point here. TP104. That thing I was poking before that I thought might be another fuse, that's the crystal there that runs the switch mode driver thing. Uh, I was going to try measuring that. That seems like the first thing you'd want to do, isn't it? Measure to see that you're actually getting power into the system. And just noticed looking close down at that, that test point that there's another pin from a jumper wire right next to it and the bit of wire has been poked over onto the test point. So that's probably creating a short circuit. This is not what we want. Because I don't think they're the same net. It didn't look like it. So those are no longer shorted now. Let's see if this made any difference. I don't know, has that always been like that? Or has someone been in there and poked it about? Okay, it still doesn't start up. I don't think we've disconnected anything, have we? That would have... I think the power switch is wrecked. 
Could it be that easy? Let's pull the board off and put on the one from the other camera just to rule out things. Alright, let's try measuring on that test point then. Should be 12 volts. I'm not sure if the oscillator should run when you've got nothing there. 20 volts? That seems a bit dodgy, doesn't it? 20 volts. Is that because the power supply is in standby? Because I know that some of these run a heater with 20 volts when the the camera's not on. You can see there on the power supply it says 20 volts and then 12 volts is on the other pin. I suppose that's what's going on here. That would be why we're measuring 20 volts. Don't really know where else to go. I guess it'll be the same if we use that little power supply on the battery input. Well, it won't be 20 volts, it should have 12 volts under that condition. Am I joining that up wrong? No. Oh, I see. It was back feeding a bit because, yeah, the capacitors would have been charged up and it would give a charge voltage to the battery. There you go, it's now 12 volts. And that should come up on here. Pin 2 of the regulator chip, 12 volts. So that is that. This should be getting 12 volts into pin 1 of this chip, but that's only when it's powered up. So I'm not sure exactly where, how the power signal works. I need to study the circuit a bit. There's something, something in this should be getting power that can then mean it can detect the switch being pressed and then it will turn on this analog switch to then power up the voltage regulator so it's dead on that pin. That comes from QR003. I'll have to look up what that is and see if I can work out what's going on. And I think I found the problem in this camera. It's a weird one. Why it, why it doesn't power up. So I found that there's actually other parts to the service manual. I'd only just downloaded the first part. So here we go. I've got the rest. And if we look up the power supply section here. Power comes in. There's a test point where we measured and then there's this thing called unreg goes all the way over to an offboard connector there unreg and then if we go down to the where that comes in which is here unreg and that goes along into this transistor which is involved in the power on circuit and i managed to find that wow that's difficult because there's no designators written on this board and the pages that show where the parts are are black and white and hard to look at but that's there. So that transistor is supposed to have the unreg directly on it, but when I measure it, it showed like three volts. Doesn't, yeah. And if I compare that to the other MS1 camera that we took apart that does power up, it, it has the full voltage on there. And so the only conclusion I can come to is there must be a fault in the PCB somewhere. And I can prove that by joining the milliamp meter from the test point over here where the unreg is over to the pin on the transistor and then the camera will power up power leds on and probably eject it and all that business making a horrible hissing noise though because yeah, it's pretty up oh, okay it latches on so you don't have to keep holding that because that transistor involved in the power on circuit can latch it on Let's listen very carefully to find out where that hissing noise is coming from. I'm guessing it's just caps are drying out in the power supply circuits down in there where there's that switch mode. That's what it sounds like. It's just gone unstable. It will change a little bit by putting your fingers on it. So it, do it doesn't have a picture. Because the power supply voltages will be super noisy, uh, I think we can have a look at that. There, that's what you see. Because it's, yeah, rough. I guess we can put that tape in. See if anything happens. Oh, it's got problems. Yeah, I don't think that's a good idea. You would have to replace the power supply capacitors and get that into working order before it's worth trying to get the tape mechanism up and running. But that's a weird thing. So if we turn it off now, it won't turn back on again because it's missing that uh, unregulated voltage coming into the top of the transistor to do the power control. 
so I guess there's a problem somewhere there. That's the transistor, and the unread comes into that pin there, right where there's a little dot. That's the dot of glue that was used for gluing this down so it could go through the wave for soldering. So that track, presumably also related to that capacitor, wherever that goes, there's some there's a break somewhere in the board between that net, well that point on the net there where the test point is and a couple other pins and over there it is not, doesn't go off board and I don't think there's any links because the schematic just showed it as that there's no other things in the path which is how I was able to work out that there's a problem there because I probe it on the good camera and get full voltage get a very low voltage which would have been leaking through tracks through another path on that one so there you go that's MS1 Panasonic NV MS1 cameras and weirdly there's another there's a VHSC camera that has the same model number so watch out for that because you'll get that when you try and look up the service manual for these uh, one last thing before we go there's one more camera in the series that I own except I only own a little bit of it now because I threw the rest out many years ago this is what I have left of an M40 a much newer camera super bulging ugly rounded casing was around it I don't have that anymore because it was quite upsetting to look at I don't know what their deal is they could have made such a really nice compact video camera with this stuff see it's all optimized down to just one board with some chips on it there is an SVHS version of this which I guess has this extra stuff fitted and also there's a hi-fi audio version which yeah, would, again would use up more of those parts but there was so much potential in here to make a nice compact VHS camera but they wrecked it by putting it in a huge enclosure for like completely no reason at all there's just so much wasted space I don't know what what was the point of doing that this does have the onboard actual part and someone's glued it yeah though they changed to a weird connector instead of the um, that round the round one that was used on everything previous so now it's that and those are always snapped off because the way they made the, the cables was quite bad or stuck out a long way with a quite a big thick um, thing on it uh, so I don't know if this works it has a light that you can clip into there yeah, contacts and the light is controlled by a FET on this little board in the bottom I can't remember if this works or not I have got the other mechanism bit that goes there the control panel needs to plug in I think we should try powering it up though just for fun see what it does if it does anything I'll just get some other bits to power this up got some bits and pieces see these are the batteries that go in the M5, M7 cameras but this one M40 and probably others I think it's MS something in M3 3000 there's a whole bunch of other model numbers that are a similar form factor to this big ugly one they changed to this quite smaller battery but it has the same capacity so I guess that's just the improvement in battery technologies you see that's a 2 amp hour pretty old one this is 2.3 amp hour and then I guess that's 0.3 you can see the cells are supposed closer together so there'll be two volt cells in there, lead acid. And another weird new battery mounting method, it now slides into this thing. And then there's a jet lever somewhere. That's something to do with that. Now the power supply cable, this is the power supply. It's got that to charge the battery, which is what the other ones have as well. You clip that onto the end there. So it will fit any size because they all have the same configuration. But you can power it by these batteries, they just don't latch in because so if you hold that down it will work. And then there's this cable with that weird plug on it. That plugs in there. And then the other end goes to the camera. I don't know if this power supply works, let's find out. Nope, the light doesn't come on. So I guess that's it's wrecked. It's given up the ghost. Oh yeah, well, so we can't use that. I've got a bunch of other parts that came off this camera. That's so that's the cassette mechanism, the light. 
the viewfinder, but I don't think I have the housing for it. I, don't know, I think that's from a different camera. Because that has a plug there. Okay, I guess I got my viewfinders crossed somewhere. That goes with something else. And the little control panel, which um, you use for the thing. I don't know if that belongs on this camera. It might do. Zoom control. Little plug in the end there. The only reason I kept this stuff was just so I could compare it to the older cameras to see how different or similar the mechanism is. That was the main intention. Is that true? Maybe that is the right viewfinder and that is a titling connector. I think that's what's going on here. I think that is the right viewfinder and it plugs in here. Yeah, that looks good. That's going to short out. Don't know what that does. Probably the microphone. Who knows. Alright, let's turn this on and see what it does. Uh, we're going to have to find a way of joining onto it. That's the battery input there. I can't easily... Uh, we can probably plug in the battery terminal from the other camera and then clip onto that. See, did they keep the pin out the same with this this little connector? No, it's reversed. Great. I uh, love backwards compatibility. <laughs> I've swapped plus plus and minus over from the different cameras. Great. So that means we'll join this up wrong and then it will be right. Okay, we'll try not to let that touch much. And we'll get the video cable over onto this. I don't know how much that matters if it's touching. Viewfinder's down there. Oh, it powered up. Oh. Oh, maybe the current needs to be set higher. Mm, yeah, it's on. But it's flashing. Hey, I've got a really clear picture out of it. Let's turn on the capture. Look at that. Beautiful, clear image. Oh, not for long. I remember this has weird effects you can use, like strobing and flickering and then maybe it was a different model. I wonder if we can probably can't load a tape into it. Let's see if it will just accept this being shoved onto it. No, it might be something unplugged or missing for the cassette mechanism. And what would it need that's on this? Uh, probably that. I think that would be a cassette in switch. And it's got the end sensors. Oh, and a dew sensor. That's probably what it's complaining about. Because the resistance of that will be wrong. Let's see if we can get rid of that control panel since that's pretty useless. And we'll add back in this cassette mechanism and try and work out where those wires went or go. Oh yeah, I remember now. This camera was in very bad shape when it was given to me. It's... I think someone's dropped it with the cassette door open and smashed something. And well, bent it all out of alignment. I remember now what's... what the deal is. Because I'm trying to put this back in and noticing how... Um, not willing it is. Yeah, it... it was all bent. I wonder if we can get it in far enough to load a tape. I guess we should screw it down. Then that's the right screw. But anyway, the mechanism layout is pretty similar between this and the older machines. It shows they were onto a good thing right at the start there. Pretty much sold it in the first go. And it's just had refinements since then over the years through the different models. Because right back to the M1, we see this same basic layout. Just some things have been cheapened by changing them to plastic. Let's see if we can hook up the wires on that. Uh, where do the wires go? That's the question. And one coming through from the other side. Onto there. Yeah, let's see if it powers up now. And it's still got a flashing light. Yeah, maybe it's wrecked. I wonder what could be the problem. Maybe that's for the reason why I took it apart and didn't yeah, bother to keep anything because it was in a not very well working condition. The viewfinder goes. I 
It seems like the loading motor doesn't run because that should it should wind that in and out a bit when it starts up. Okay, it is winding something. Maybe it's a mode switch issue. Where is the mode switch? Don't know, it will be one of those flexes. Oops, that wire ripped out. Oh well. The mode switch plugs on with that. That looks all fine. Yeah, and there's a board to board connector for the camera so you can't have this board folded out while it's running unless you've got extender cables. Oh well, I guess it was not to be. Anyway, there you go, that's what an M40 is like. It's turned into a cheap plasticky thing which has a lot of free space inside the housing. Just to see what it hap what happened as things became miniaturized, they just made the housing bigger so it looks more professional. Uh, but actually the older ones were a lot nicer in terms of integrating components into tight spaces. Great. There's a look at Panasonic NV-MS1 SVHS camera. This design is based on the NV-M7 VHS video cameras.